welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that gives you curly styles that lasts all day. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to identify issues that may need to be escalated whenever you run into problems out on your network. This comes from our Network Plus certification in 10 004, section 4.7. And this is really talking about problems that are very major. These are problems like switching loops, routing loops, route problems, proxy ARPs, and broadcast storms. And generally, these are issues that affect a lot of people at once, and they're problems that usually have to be resolved by somebody who's specializing in those particular areas. Let's start by talking about switching loops and broadcast storms. Whenever you start working with switches, one of the things that you must always be careful about is creating a loop. If you were to take a link coming out of a switch and plug it directly back into the switch on the same physical VLAN, the same VLAN configuration, what you're going to have is a loop. One of the problems you have with Ethernet at layer two when a loop occurs is that there's no way to know it's looping. It will just start looping around and looping around and looping around. Unlike the IP protocol, there's no time to live frame. There's no time to live variable that's within these frames. So when you plug it into the switch, it could just loop forever back and forth. And the more traffic that you have on the network, the more it will loop. And ultimately, what you find out is the switch itself is learning completely wrong information about where traffic is. It's coming out one port. It's going into another port. It's coming out another port again. It gets confused about where anything's located. And this can cause serious, serious problems. The way that most people resolve or, or make sure that they don't run into this issue is they use the spanning tree protocol. One of our early videos talked about STP and how people use spanning tree to prevent loops from occurring on their network. So if you hear that somebody's running spanning tree on a switch, it's so that this particular kind of problem doesn't occur. The issue with this type of loop, though, is that it happens very, very quickly. You'll know pretty quick if you create a loop because your network goes down. It goes down pretty hard. When you have so much going, especially broadcasts that are sent out to every port, and they start looping around, then you can really overwhelm the switch and all of the devices connected to the switch. It's not unusual to take down servers that are just being overwhelmed with broadcasts and traffic all coming at it at full line rate. So it's something that is pretty debilitating. When you plug in and create a loop on a switch network, you're going to get a phone call pretty quick. You'll know what happened. And that's why when we talk about having change control and testing things after you make a change, this is one of the really good reasons why you'd want to do that. So if you're in a situation where you need to troubleshoot that switching loop, it's going to be kind of tough because as soon as you create that that loop, it, you're going to find the network is going to crawl to its knees. Most times, the equipment that you're using as your switch and the infrastructure just cannot handle that much traffic being looped through it constantly. And as the more traffic gets on the network, then the more it will loop. And it just creates a problem that is combines itself over and over and over again. The network will just become completely unresponsive. Sometimes it requires you fixing the loop and rebooting your core switch or rebooting the switch switch that you've looped just to make sure you can make that problem go away. What usually is good, though, is you'll know if you do this. You'll know pretty quick. You plug it in, the phone will ring and say, we aren't able to communicate anymore on our network. So don't go like that. Don't, don't plug that in that way. Make sure you're doing these types of changes when there is a change control in place. Uh, this type of problem will affect everybody on the network. So you want to be sure that you don't create that kind of looping issue on the network. And if you do, trust me, you'll know pretty quick and you can go undo what you just did. Routing loops, they sound very similar to a switching loop, but functionally they operate very differently. A routing loop works like this. You have a, a routing table inside of a device that says, if I need to get this traffic out, I send it to router B. And router B has a table that unfortunately is misconfigured in it that says, well, that should go to, to router A, sends it back to router A. B, A sends it back to B, B sends it back to A. It just goes back and forth. It just bounces like a tennis ball back and forth over and over again. Sometimes there are multiple routers set up. A says go to B, B says go to C, C says go to A, and repeat over and over and over again. So these routing type problems become a little bit of, a, of an issue. Fortunately, they don't cause quite the major issues a switching loop might have. And that's because the IP protocol has a field in it called time to live. And every time a, a frame goes through a router, the router takes one number off of that time to live. You'll see this represented as TTL. You'll see that all the time whenever you're looking at pings, you're looking at traffic, you're looking at a protocol decode, you'll see the time to live field. That's what that is. So if the time to live goes all the way down, you get to the last router, and it says, 
my time to live is one. This, the, this now has lived as long as it's going to live. It is going to live no more. I'm going to drop this frame, and I'm going to send a message back to the original IP address, send a message via ICMP that says, I just dropped this thing. The time to live got down to one. I was going to take it to zero, which means it doesn't live anymore. Just thought you'd like to know that I got rid of this frame you sent out. Now, most of the time, the end station doesn't even realize it. They don't report on these types of things. But if you have some type of network analysis device, you're capturing packets, you'll see where ICMP time to live has been exceeded. And you'll know, oh, I might have a loop on my network somewhere. If you do a trace route, you'll see there's a loop. You'll go to one router, which goes to another router, which goes back to that original router somehow. You'll see the loop occurring. And a good way to do that is just to bring up a, a, a trace route and run a trace route to the destination IP address. And you'll see where router A on this IP address, then it goes to router B, then it goes to router A, then it goes to router B, then it goes to router A and B and A and B. It just goes on and on and on. You'll know, yep, I got a loop. What you'll want to do is talk to the person in charge of the routes of a configuring your routers and where the traffic goes and let them know that you've got a routing loop. Here is the IP address it's sourced from and the destination IP address of where it's going. And then they can work out within their routers step by step by step where that packet is supposed to go and hopefully fix the routing loop that they have inside of their routing tables. Well, routing loops aren't the only kind of problems you'll run into with routers. One of the route problems you'll run into is if you just don't have a route. You have a packet go into a router, and the router doesn't know what to do with the packet. So by default, the packet is dropped, just drops it on the floor. I don't know where to send this. There it goes. Many routers have inside of them configured. The router administrator puts a default route that says, if I don't know where I'm going, if this route isn't specifically listed, just send it over there. And usually that works fine. If you say, if it's not an internal address, send it out to the internet. That usually works pretty well. But sometimes those routes can be done incorrectly or send traffic into a black hole and it just gets dropped on the floor and that traffic never gets to its destination. That usually just causes lack of connectivity. You can't ping it. You can't get to where you're going. You try to browse and you can't browse anywhere. The traffic is ultimately getting to a router and just being dropped completely. If you do a trace route, you can at least see in your trace route where the packet is going and then you'll see where it doesn't go any further. You can provide that trace route information back to the router administrator and say, I'm escalating this problem because I believe this route doesn't exist to wherever it is we're trying to go. Routing issues can be a little bit hairy, but fortunately, they're very easy to troubleshoot. Every device has a routing table. Every computer, every printer, every router, everything that works at layer three has a routing table. So if you're working on a Linux or Unix type environment, if you just type route at your command line, you can see the routes there. If you're running Windows, you type route print, and it will print out a list of all the routes that are on your network. Here's an example of the route table in one of my computers. My 0.0.0.0, .0, .0 is my default route. And that's one of the things we were just mentioning. If I don't have a very specific destination for this, by default, go to this gateway, 192.168.0.1. .1. I have a number of IP uh, adapters in my device, a number of Ethernet adapters with IP on them. So you'll see a number of different networks here. For instance, a 192.168.0.0, that goes, everything there goes out 0 0.7. If I'm going to 192.168.56.0, that subnet, use this IP address outside of my computer to get to that subnet. So you can see the routing table, there's a lot in here, but it's a very simple process. It's the destination, the mask, the gateway, the interface that it's going to use, and the priority or the metric associated with that. So as long as you can look at the routing table here, I can make a determination, oh, I know it must be going out this port. Let's find out where it goes to the next hop, and then we'll look at the routing table on that router. And then that router says it's sent out to this router. Let's look at the routing table on that router. So very simple process to go from router to router to router. Unfortunately, you may be in these situations where one organization takes care of one router. You may have an external provider that takes care of another router. So there may be multiple people you have to call to solve some of these very difficult routing problems. Another problem you may run into that affects communication over the network is a proxy ARP. A proxy ARP is when a device is answering an ARP request for an, an, for an address, a MAC address, that's not its own. 
So it's answering on behalf of someone else. Now, this may be something that you're doing intentionally on your network. It may be very specific configuration from a security perspective, uh, from a VPN. VPN concentrators will do this so that everybody knows if you're going to communicate out to a device on the VPN, just talk to me. I'll take it from there. You can also see in proxy ARPs are configured when they are redundant routers. So the routers are communicating as if they are the same device, for instance. So proxy ARPs can be very useful. Uh, it's just when they create problems is the issue because if a device is answering an ARP on behalf of someone else and it's doing it incorrectly, well, now you don't have a way to get there because you don't have the MAC address of the true destination. Essentially becomes a black hole so that I'm now sending traffic to where I think it should be going to get to that IP address. It's not really the right MAC address. Somebody told me wrong. It gave me the wrong MAC address, and now I can't communicate out over the network. We can confirm this by looking at the ARP table that's in our workstation and see what MAC addresses we've gathered for the different IP addresses on our network. And if we do that here on my Windows machine, if I do an ARP-A, it's very similar in a Linux environment to do the ARP command, we can see that my machine knows that it, if it's going to talk to 192.168.0.1, that it should communicate that to that device over this physical address. And you can see these are dynamically configured because they're, they're the ones that I'm learning as I go. If I want to talk to 192.168.0.2, I need to talk to this MAC address. Now, ideally, all of these MAC addresses should be different because all of these IP addresses are different. If there is a device that has multiple IPs and a single MAC address, that's kind of unusual. You don't see that very normally. There are servers that are configured that way. But if I happen to see that one, two, five, six, those all four of these happen to have the same MAC address, I might wonder if there's some type of uh, proxy art problem associated with that. I need to now talk to who's configured the devices on the subnet and find out why am I seeing the same MAC address even though I'm talking to multiple IP addresses. Let's see what we've learned for our module where we are escalating these much larger issues to someone else. How are we going to be able to confirm that a routing loop is occurring? There was one command we ran where we could see the loop go from A to B to A to B to A to B, and that was a trace route. Another question is, what do you call a station that provides a MAC address response for an IP address that's not its own? It's essentially giving you a MAC address, but it wasn't the guy we asked to begin with. Well, we call that a proxy ARP. And we've already seen how we can look at our ARP table to determine if that's occurring. And our third question, how can you confirm that a router has a bad routing table? Well, one way to do it is we can look at a trace route and see exactly where the route's going and see if it's going to the wrong place. Usually, we have to confer with others to understand how the routing is supposed to be on our network. But providing that information up to whoever manages the routes will usually solve that problem for you. Well, that covers the issues we need to have for our N10004 section 4.7, where we are escalating problems like switching loops, loops, routing loops, route problems, proxy ARPs, and broadcast storms. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to see all of our other Network Plus videos, participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.